What is going on, everybody? It's the Frost, and we're here for SmackDown Live review for June 11, 2019. SmackDown Live going off the air about 30 minutes ago when I start recording this. This show just did not have anything on it practically. This show just felt so flat. It was better than Monday Night Raw. League's better, and that's not hard to do because Monday Night Raw has been awful for weeks, months, day, weeks, months, years. Raw has been awful. Three years ago, and three years, like two and a two years, and like ten months ago, SmackDown was the show to watch. Now it's just starting to feel a lot more like Monday Night Raw. It's easier to get through because it's only two hours, but SmackDown Live is just getting just getting to the point where it's like, why is anybody watching this show? And to think, WWE has to do something to have fans of all ages sitting at home on a Friday night who. Especially the demographic that they should be going after, which is the young fan, the young, the young teens to young adults who want to go out and hang out with friends on a Friday night because school's out usually on the in, like school's out during the school year, and summer is summer. They're gonna try and convince. They're gonna try and say, "Hey, forget your friends, forget all that stuff. You should be staying home and watching SmackDown Live because we have the best show out there. We have a WWE champion." Throwing pancakes like a fucking child. We have the best in the world, Shane McMahon, being pushed for, pushed higher on the card than the likes of a Heavy Machinery and Aleister Black. Can we get this motherfucker a match? We got him being pushed more than a Kevin Owens, a in anybody else that you can think of, a Shelton Benjamin who hasn't been seen in a long time outside of the Greatest Royal Rumble. I mean, I'm sorry, Super Showdown last weekend. You're going to expect anybody, and I mean anybody, to sit there and watch this shit. Which, by the way, I just realized this. What is WWE going to do for the Saudi shows and SmackDown Live? SmackDown Live will be on Fox on Friday, in, on Fridays by the time the next Saudi show starts, um, comes around. How is WWE going to be able to do a SmackDown Live and a Saudi show, and Fox doesn't want this shit to be taped unless necessary, which would be, of course, a, um, a holiday show or a, um, UK show because they have no choice. I don't see WWE going to be able to do Saudi shows on Fridays anymore. Maybe they'll do them on Saturdays. Who knows? It's going to be really weird for them. But anyway, back on the subject. This show is just so bad, so plain, and so boring. Xavier Woods... Austin Creed, who's been at E3 all weekend long, had to be had to come from E3, a place that this guy was in video game heaven, getting to play Gears 5 with AJ Styles and Tyler Breeze before anybody else had to drop everything he's doing there, fly back to fly to Sacramento, California, which is that or not fly, he just probably drove there because it's not that far away, and can participate in SmackDown Live. He wanted to get out of, he wanted to get done with his segments and the match tonight so fast so he could get done, get shower, get dressed, and head back to E3. Xavier Woods would rather be at E3 than this shitty fucking show. That tells you something there. No Finn Balor this week. Alistair Black is still locked in a, in, in, in a dark room, even though they opened the door and he actually screamed down in it and nothing happened. Get this motherfucker a match. I'm so tired of seeing Alistair Black sit there and just begging and pleading for somebody to pick a fight with him. Why don't you go and pick a fight with somebody else? Get some, give us a reason to see you on TV other than in short-winded segments. No Andrade, no um, Charlotte Flair this week as well for the simple fact that um, almost his mom passed away. Like mere hours after his match with Finn Balor. So they were giving the time off. I'm sure they'll be off for the majority for the rest of this week, and we probably won't see them on SmackDown on, on, on anything, or even if you go to house shows, till probably the weekend or post or SmackDown Live next week. So my wish, it, my um, my thoughts and prayers go out to Andrade and his family, as well as everyone else involved. So there's that. We go right to the ring as soon as the show goes off the um comes on, and we have the Miz for Wild Card Rule number one. Miz is coming to smack up from on uh, the Wild Card Rule, and Greg Hamilton does his introduction as the fan pop. Fans pop. Miz isn't happy because he's forced to be. He's being forced to follow the script tonight. He welcomes everyone to the show. He says tonight's guest is specifically requested. 
specifically requested that Major introduces Drew McIntyre with the grand introduction. He's reading off some cards that he was given to by Shane McMahon. Miz then messes up the introduction on Shane McMahon calling him first the breast in the world. And he's like, there's a smudge. And then he's like, it's the pest in the world. The, the fans cheer about that and says he says the pest in the world, Shane McMahon. Out comes Shane with Drew McIntyre and Elias. So that's two wildcard rules within two minutes. Within the first two minutes of the show, you had The Miz and Drew McIntyre. And don't say, oh, well, Drew's with Shane, so he doesn't count. There was nothing in the rules that said that if you're with Shane, if you're, if you're with the McMahon, you don't count for the wildcard rule. That's two already. We go to see the World Cup trophy on display at ringside as Shane get, has Hamilton give the proper introduction. And boo, Shane poses. Shane said, has Elias play guitar, which, by the way, Elias was there with him too. A you suck chant at him. Shane says, fans think the Miz show sucks. He's like, they was chanting you suck, and he's like, that's for you, Schmidt. Miz, this is your show. No, Shane. They're chanting you suck because you're 48 years old, taking up TV time when heavy machinery has hardly been seen. Shelton Benjamin hasn't been seen since the Superstar Shake-Up last year. Um, let's see what else. Let's see, Alistair Black hasn't had a match since the Superstar Shake-Up. The week after the Superstar Shake-Up when they broke up him and Ricochet. Um, let's see, the Good Brothers, oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, the Good Brothers on some, uh, um, and there's many, many more if you can think of them. I'm going to have to get a list. I'm going to have to get a list of Raw and SmackDown superstars for next week. So if Shane McMahon's on there again, I can list off who's been missing from TV. Shane says, fans think the Miz suck. Brags about beating Roman by himself at Super Showdown. Fans boost some more. Shane says, Reigns shouldn't be ashamed because he lost to the best in the world. And Shane, Shane flies back about how, how all of wins, Shane's wins are tainted. He brings up some of the recent matches and says, you won, you won at WrestleMania on a technicality. How, um, can someone explain to me how that match is tainted? You suplexed him. You fell. He, when the bounce happened, he, you bounced, he bounced higher than you did. And you land, he landed on top of you. So a one, two, three. No technicality, Miz. You lost to him fair and square at WrestleMania. I'm just saying. Not taking Shane's side, but I'm just saying. Then he talked about how you, he got away from slipping, um, slipping away from him at the money in the bank, at money in the bank, and I'm like, yeah, that one was a little more fucked up because the referee had stopped his count after Miz hit the skull crusher finale on a chair and should have pinned Shane, but no, they had Shane win in the stupidest way, again making Miz look like a fucking fool. Shane mocks Miz and tells him to do his job and start an interview. Miz says, oh, you want me to do my my job? Well, Roman has some words after Super Showdown, so let's look at that. And we see Saxon interviewing Reigns backstage. He talks about how he will kick ass and take names, starting with Drew at Stomping Grounds. Drew takes the mic down and addresses the match with Reigns at Stomping Grounds and says he will enjoy hurting people and he has a weapon that no one else around here does, the Claymore Kick. Drew says he's going to kick Reigns' head off of him at stomping ground. Back and forth on the mic, on the mic continues as Stun Pants Champ boring because, yes, this entire 30 minutes, this was the first half of the first hour of the show practically, was absolutely boring. This is why fans are not coming back. This is why ratings are down. Raw had the worst rated sh um, show outside of holidays. Of all time, outside of holidays, outside the NFL, of all time, the third hour dropped with the, for, below two million, which I knew it was going to. I will get into that on Saturday on Unscripted, if anyone cares to listen. Oh, by the way, Shane was um, Miz was wearing a custom T-shirt which had a picture of his dad, like with the with his fist up at WrestleMania with the word "mood" above it. So I'm like, please tell me they're not going to sell that shit because that is fucking awful. Shane takes a shot at Mrs. Dad, and he says, "You come from a cesspool of like he come, you come from a set from a cesspool that um, has something to do with him being related to a potato." And he got pissed about that. Drew and 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 Miz get into each other's faces. Shane's like, "Oh, you want another fight with the best in the world? Okay, but you have on one condition: you must be defeat Elias. Then you must defeat McIntyre. And if Miz gets through that." Then Shane will give him his dream match against the best in the world again. 
calls for a referee and scene. So that was commercial break. Back from break, we have Elias versus The Miz. This match was short and sweet. Call question finale to Elias for the one, two, three. Lasted maybe two or three minutes, if that. Drew McIntyre rushes in and prepares to do a battle with Miz as we go to commercial break. This match started with the picture in picture if you are in the States. Back from break and the match is in the way. Drew McIntyre control for a few minutes, but the Miz turning around. Miz sent Drew to the floor to regroup. Shane checks on Drew as ring sign until Miz comes out with an attack. This leads to Drew carrying in in the ring. Miz blocks that and drops Drew for a big DDT as fans pop. Shane gets up on the apron to provide a distraction to stop the skull crusher finale. Drew takes advantage and drops Miz with a glass cow kiss. Play more kick, one, two, three, and that was that. No match, supposedly, between Shane and the Miz. After the match, Shane enters the ring and says maybe he, in, he and the Miz should have their match after all. And Shane says, call for the bell. And we have Shane versus Miz. And Shane beats the Miz again. What a fucking loser Shane Miz looks like. Like, does he have internal heat backstage or something? Because the Miz is getting beat by Shane again. He looks like a fucking loser. He looks like a geek. He looks like that kid who gets picked on by everybody just because people feel like it. He looks like a chump. He looks like a joke. This is just Miz getting, looking worse and worse as we go. So, this is, and here's the thing. It would not surprise me if Kofi Kingston loses his WWE Championship to Shane McMahon at SummerSlam. It would not fucking surprise me if Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon become the first father-son duo, I believe, to hold the WWE Championship. I could see Vince wanting to do is like, oh, this is a genius. I held the WWF title back in 1999. Shane's going to win it 20 years later. Oh, I'm a genius. If that is to happen, I guarantee you, the ratings will go so far down. Fox will cancel their deal with, with WWE. And, Sh and SmackDown Live will be out of a TV spot and after October. USA Network did not want to keep SmackDown. If USA Network wanted to keep SmackDown, USA Network would have gave them a billion dollars for SmackDown as well. They did not want to do that. They did not. They, they they said no. You can go take shop SmackDown around, but we want to keep Monday Night Raw. This is just getting worse and worse and worse as it is. And if we see this happen, and it just feels like they're building to where Shane versus it's going to be Shane and Drew McIntyre versus Roman Reigns at. Extreme Rules, and if Shane and Drew McIntyre end up winning that match, it's going to be Kofi versus Shane at SummerSlam with Shane winning the WWE Championship. I'm that's this is loosely me booking what I think they're going to do. I wouldn't want to see that with anything, but I can honestly see. How about this? Twenty years after Vince McMahon won the WWF Championship, his son does it. I believe it was two. It was, I believe it was ninety nine. It was ninety nine, right? But could you imagine? Twenty years later. Shane McMahon is your WWE champion for a month. God, that would be so awful. Going into um, to Fox, that would be the I think that would be the that would be the finger poker doom bag in WWE. Then he goes to Sammy Deville approach Ember Moon, taunting her for reading books and suggesting she reads. Well, she was playing a Nintendo Switch. I don't know who thought that was reading, but she was on her Nintendo Switch. She actually had a Nintendo Switch in her hand. The neon red and the neon red and neon blue Joy-Con, um, the the base model with the G, with the neon um, red and blue. I have that exact same switch. This is how Woods and Devel Bullies Moon apparently ahead of the match later on. They threw like she swiped the switch out of Moon's hand and Moon like pretty much um, just did like a warrior cry after they left. And I'm like. Yeah, if you touch my Nintendo Switch like that and you break it, which honestly it sounded like that shattered into a million pieces, I hope to hell that was a prop and not the real thing. Because if that thing were to shatter into pieces or even be knocked out of my hands, whoever did it, someone better hold me back. Because I've been going to jail for fucking you up and probably sending you to the morgue. I'm just saying, don't fuck with a gamer. I respect Ember Moon for that. And I was sick, sorely disappointed she didn't get involved with the match between Carmella and Sonya Deville or after the match taking both of these women out. If you're going to have 
them trying to bully Ember Moon. She needs to have a retaliation. This is another week and another week and another week. Get this woman out there attacking these two and standing up because all she's doing is letting them do this and doing nothing. Uh, heavy Machinery plus it's AJ Kush and David Ottawa. Ot up comes SmackDown Tag Team Champions before we go to commercial break. Back from break and then Marion has a mic and says we're going to be we're, it says we're on a treat we're in for a treat tonight because the Planets Tag Team Champions will be going defending against the Yolo County Tag Team Champions. We see two enhancement talents in the ring with card board title belts. You couldn't go to the um, to the local knockoff store and find two championship belts and have them hold those as big championships. You really had to have cardboard championships. What is this? What culture from what is this? What culture wrestling from 2015 to 2017? Seriously, is that what this is? If you don't know that reference, back in 2015 to 2017, when Adam Lumpy and Adam Bacchetti were part of what culture wrestling, they had a they had a cardboard championship that represented that they used for their um, prediction shows. The winner would get to be able to be the what culture heavyweight champion, which was this cardboard belt. So it was like, I got those flashbacks, and I'm like, man, I miss old work culture. Out comes Heavy Machinery to the ramp. Otis and Tucker and Otis talk about how Brian and Rowan are ducking them, and how they, they're just blue-collar guys who like to have a good time. Tucker says they want they would win the titles if they would get a shot. Brian says, you haven't done anything, and this is true, you haven't done anything to earn a shot from against us. But how about this? You take on the Yolo County Tag Team Champions, and we'll see what that does for you. Challenge accepted. The bell rings. Tucker starts unloading on the opponents. Otis comes in. Doug double team in the corner. Otis ends up hitting the caterpillar. Otis tags in. Tags Tucker in. Compactor for the one, two, three. And I like the way they did it because they did the compactor. And Tucker got enough height that Otis was able to roll out of the way. And he landed right on top of his opponent. One, two, three. And they won. Is it the way I want to see Heavy Machinery going out there beating Jobbers? No, but hey. They got time on TV for the first time in for fuck ever. Hopefully this will lead to a tag team title match at Stomping Grounds because quite honestly, everything at Stomping Grounds is a rematch of one thing or another. We have WrestleMania rematches, we have Super Shoutout rematches, we have Extreme Rules 2016, uh, 2017 rematches going on. This is not a good pay-per-view, and you wonder why. We'll get into ticket sales this Saturday as well. 24-7 champion R-Truth is backstage with Carmelo. Truth talks about the recent title happenings and how the title is ruining his life, stressing him out. He calls it the 7-Eleven title, where he has someone coming and Carmelo hides Truth in a large production case. Unfortunately, the coast is clear, and now Carmelo tries to get Truth out of the box, but it gets locked. A staffer walks up and tells Carmelo her match is next. She has to leave, but promises she will help Truth. Out of the box, Truth starts screaming. Jinder Mahal walks by and hears Truth screaming, having an ox having an oxygen uh, having problems um, breathing. Jinder Mahal tries to sound like Carmelo. He tells Truth to stay right there while he goes off to get a crowbar. Jinder walks off as Truth continues screaming inside a locked box. Now, just a little survival tip to anybody: don't fucking panic. If you panic, you're going to die a lot faster. And if you get locked in something like that and you have problems breathing, you have problems breathing. I know the um. The um, instinct is to panic, but don't panic. Just be cool, calm and collected, and you could survive a lot longer than you do panicking because you're using a lot more energy when you panic. Just saying. Please keep this stuff off TV. I mean, this was about, this was this and what happened later, which was Jinder Mahal finally finds a ref and a crowbar, and the boxes are missing, and they find them out there, and Jinder Mahal... Is, and our truth is still stuck in, but apparently he's going to LA in a crate, so there's that. But that's about it. They didn't do much with the 24 7 title as much as they did yesterday, where they did countless backstage things of him being stuck in an elevator with a bunch of superstars who want to beat him for this title. Mala versus Sony Neville. Okay, match here. Sony Neville, she is improving a little bit. I mean, it sucks that we don't get to see them like Carmella. Carmella, I wish would have stayed blonde, wait, stay, went, went back to the blonde hair, but it is what it is. She can actually wrestle when she actually tries. It's just she doesn't try half the time because of her looks. 
Can we get her out of that onesie, please? I mean, yeah, she's not wearing what she used to wear because it's because they because down in NXT, Liv Morgan showed up and Liv Morgan dressed exactly like Carmella, which is why I always called her the Carmella Car- the, the Carmella copycat. And now she's and for a while there, she was wearing a two piece with the top and a bottom, and then they put her back in the onesie, and it just looks awful. Can we cut the middle out and just have her be the top like the the short and the the, the, the top and the shorts, please? Because I just, the onesie just looks terrible. Carmella goes out the road towards the end of this match, chasing her back in the ring. The bell takes advantage, levels Carmella. Oh, after, she shows out the road, chasing her back into the ring. The bell takes her and, and, um, and levels Carmella for a two count. Carmella t- sends the bell out of the ring, and she lands hard on the floor. Carmella runs the ropes and hits a suicide dive, taking both the bell and Rose down for a pop. Carmella brings the bell back into the ring, but Rose gets involved, pulling her down as she's trying to get up. Carmella lands a super kick onto the bell. Uh, not on the bill, but to Rose. She gets back in the ring. High knee by, um, high jumping knee by the bill for the one, two, three. Carmella loses to Sonya the bill. After the match, the bill exits the ring and celebrates with Rose down the ramp. And we go to replay. Carmella sits in the middle of the ring and stares at Rose and the bill as they head to the back. And this would have been the time, the time to give us. Um, Ember Moon attacking these two. She, they could have been packing up the ring, and, uh, up the ramp, and you could have saw the Ember Moon standing there, seething, pissed off, taking both of these women down. But no. Another week, she gets bullied by these two. Another week, she does nothing. This woman could kick both of these women's asses, and they just won't let her do anything. She's supposed to just sit there, doing nothing, reading a book, playing on a Nintendo Switch or something, letting these two women bully her, and do nothing. How long is it going to be until she actually does something and starts fighting back? On card number three and four, Alexa Bliss is backstage with Nikki Cross. Bliss asks Cross if she's okay, and she is. Bliss says Cross must have not have heard. Bliss says if Cross is going to find out, it should be from a friend. Bliss talks about how social media was full of com- comments against Cross after she interfered in a tag team match on Raw last night, standing across from her in the ring. Cross, um, they, Bellis says Cross can get payback on Bailey tonight, but she, but when she's standing across from her in the ring, she says picture, she should picture all the social media bullies instead of Bailey. Bellis tells Cross not to hold back. Cross stares off in thought. So basically, they're using Alexa Bliss to manipulate Nikki Cross into doing her dirty work. That's all this is going to be. I don't see where this is going until Nikki Cross finally snaps out of it, and this will probably be after Alexa Bliss wins a the SmackDown Live Women's Championship or the Raw Women's Championship. And WWE is far behind; it's far more behind Becky Lynch than they are Bailey. I'm hoping they don't have Bailey lose to Alexa Bliss because it makes absolutely no sense. If you're going to do that, then just merge the championships and be done with it. Out comes the new day, the full new day. There is Big E too, and we come back from commercial break. Woods and Kofi are happy because this is the actual return of Big E. What was the fucking point of bringing a guy who was not medically cleared back three weeks ago? He didn't do shit to help the plot between him and Kevin Owens or him and Dolph Ziggler, which I believe that was the night Dolph Ziggler attacked um, Kofi Kingsley, and it was. I believe it was. Uh, fans pop, cheer them on. Big E jokes that if he had a title run for every time he returned, he would be Charlotte Flair. I pop for that one because that's fucking hilarious. Biggie, every single time he gets a chance, he always likes to take a dig at Charlotte Flair. This was some. This isn't the first time he took a dig at Charlotte Flair. This is back when Charlotte was still on Monday Night Raw, and her and Sasha Banks were still um, throwing were were flip flopping the title between the two. He made a comment. It was like um, Charlotte Flair will be will break her dad's record in, in next week or something. It's just like. Biggie always taking digs at Charlotte when he can. Fans pop, then they go on about tonight's match and how Kofi can beat Dolph and Super. How Kofi beat Dolph at Super Showdown. Kofi says Ziggler won't be able to run at st- stomping grounds when they do battle in a steel cage. They go on until music hits and out comes Dolph, Dolph Ziggler. It was before Ziggler came out that Xavier Woods mentioned that they had that tag team match tonight and he wants to beat them quite quick so they so he can hop on and go back to E3. And I'm thinking. Yeah, even Xavier Woods knows this show sucks so goddamn badly that he would rather be at E3 than here. I, here's the thing. I put this on Twitter. 
if you gave me, if someone gave you a t- gave me a threw out three tickets and said you can go either Monday Night Raw this week, this week, this week, Monday Night Raw, SmackDown Live, or the entirety of E3, I'm going to E3, no doubt about it. One day of E3, I'm still going to E3 because I will at least have some enjoyment at E3. I wouldn't feel like an idiot at, well, I always feel like an idiot any day, but that's not that. I wouldn't have my intelligence insulted at E3. Things would make sense at E3. It would be so much more fun to go to E3 than a Raw or SmackDown, period. Let's see, Ziggler won't, uh, let's see. Ziggler asked about Kofi betraying him. He says, I told, like, you, you lied to me and the fans and to yourself. You betrayed yourself because of what happened at Super Showdown. And we get another highlight package of what happened at Super Showdown because these two, I swear, if we come to SmackDown or Raw next week or whenever these guys are seen again, by the way, that's wild card number five because Ziggler is a Monday Night Raw superstar. But if I get if I have to see this again when we see video packages at the video package between these two, I'm going to rip my hair out. Up comes Yeah. Calling him a coward. Ziggler says Kofi is the WWE champion for one reason. Ziggler shows up a video of interference from the Ape during Super Showdown. Ziggler fails to include what happened before Woods got involved, which was, of course, Woods, him attacking Woods. But my defense is that doesn't matter. You could wait till the match is over. You could have easily had your buddy lose by DQ if the ref would have seen what you did. So. You're lucky it's one, not a a if you a DQ match where um, if, Zig, if if Xavier if Xavier Woods gets involved, Kofi loses the championship to Dolph Ziggler. But still, I don't give a fuck if it's like, oh, you forgot to you forgot to um put this in there that before that happened, you attacked Woods, provoking him. So fucking what? He's not involved in the match. If you're if you're around ringside and I think you're becoming a nuisance and you're on the other team. You're supporting the other guy. I'm going to knock your ass out, too. Just saying. I'm going to knock your ass out, too. Let's see. Ziggler says the footage doesn't lie, and even Kofi has to admit it that it should have been Ziggler now. Ziggler says there will be no way to run or hide at stomping grounds, and no one wants to save Kofi from Ziggler. Ziggler says Kofi and everyone else will learn what Ziggler knows. That Kofi can't beat him. Without his pals, Kofi says Ziggler forgot to show everything that happened in the video and said, asked if Ziggler really thought Woods wasn't going to retaliate. Out comes Sami Zayn, which is number six, by the way. Six members of Monday Night Raw on the wild card rule. Do not fucking tell me that, oh, McIntyre doesn't count. That would still be five. Somebody, and no, Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss are, an official, are, are not an official tag team, so that's still five. Somebody explain to me why this wildcard rule is even a thing still, if SmackDown Live always breaks the goddamn rule. Sammy talks about how they can't stand injustice and says, if the rules were reversed at Super Showtown, people would have been calling for justice for Kofi. Damn straight they would have. But somehow they're okay with what happened because it was Ziggler that got kicked. That is a funny thing, because yes, he is a heel, so if he would have won because of outside interference, people would have said, oh, that's total bullshit. But since it was Kofi getting help from Xavier Woods, oh, it's totally fine. Let's see here. Sammy says, this tells what people are discussing, people have no morals, and all that matters to them is who you do and do not like. Sammy says, they care about righting wrongs. And that's why they will do it. Biggie M mentions how they all enjoyed seeing WWE Universal Champion Seth Rollins destroy Sami Zayn with the steel K chair multiple times last night on Raw. I gotta say, um, Xavier, not Xavier, but um, Seth Rollins definitely is very vicious with that chair because he lit up Brock Lesnar on at Super Showdown, that video is on YouTube and everything, and he lit up Sami Zayn last night for sure. Sammy says, this is another clear example of hypocrisy because if anyone else is wearing the referee shirt on Raw, someone would be getting fired, but it's okay because Sammy was wearing the shirt. Sammy meant some more about how everyone is, no- is nothing but hypocrites. By the way, Sammy Zayn is auctioning off that referee shirt he wore last night on Monday Night Raw, and the funds are going to go to his Sammy for Syria um, foundation. So if you want to own, if you want to, if you have the money and you want to own, a, have a chance to own Sammy Zayn's referee shirt from last night, 
Go go to his go to his Twitter page and he has all the information there. Tell me a minute some more about how how everyone is nothing but hypocrites. Ziggler says the biggest hypocrite of them all is the one in the middle of the ring holding the WWE title. Ziggler Biggie cuts off Ziggler, praises Kofi, and talks about how his title reign is about the man who deserves it. Says this guy has worked his to- like eleven years to get to where he is. Crazy, um, Kofi says Stomping Grounds is about kicking ass and taking names. I hate that fucking t- tagline, and that's what we're go- he's going to do to Ziggler. Kofi says he will forever remain our WWE champion. No, you won't. Not past SummerSlam. Biggie says before we get to Stomping Grounds, the New Day will give Sammy Ziggler and Owens a free preview because New Day rocks, and that was that. Backstage, we see Bailey with Kayla Braxton stops her for comments asking about Alexa Bliss earlier's backstage comments on offensive tweets aimed at Nikki Cross. I don't think there was a single offensive... Ni- How could you have offensive tweets at all towards Nikki Cross? That's the big thing about it. It's like a big fraud hole. How could anybody hate Nikki Cross? She is just so goddamn awesome. Just saying. Bailey says, consider the source, that Bliss. But, and of course, there's Alexa Bliss. Bailey doesn't have a problem with Cross, but she will handle it if... if she wants to get involved. Bailey hopes Bliss is watching from inside because this will be just another moment she can't miss. God, I hate fucking rhyming sometimes. Nikki Cross versus Bailey. Out comes Bailey. We go to commercial break. Back from break, and we see Alex the Black. Vint- vignette still wanting somebody. A man, he said man or woman could come and try and pick a fight with him. Branson has a staffer open the door to the room he's in and turns and yells out the door, begging somebody, anyone. Elsa Lanaku, come and pick a fight with me. Get this guy in the ring. Why is he waiting around? Why is Alistair Black waiting around? I don't get it. Why is he waiting? I don't get why this guy is just waiting around for someone to pick a fight. You go out there in the middle of the ring and say somebody, or like, don't just wait. Just have, just go out there when you see, feel like it's time is right and pick a fight with anybody. It could be Xavier Woods or Big E, I don't care. It could be Kevin Owens or Sami Zayn. It could be Dolph Ziggler. It could be any single person. Finn Balor, the Intercontinental Champion. I would love to see Balor, the Demon, versus the Dutch Destroyer. I would love to see Xavier Woods versus um, Alistair Black. I would love to see a Shelton Benjamin, Chad Gable, which, by the way, he was on 205 Live tonight. But why is this guy just sitting around and waiting? Oh, make your, uh, take your opportunity. Nobody, like, opportunities doesn't just wait. Just, like, wait. Like, you shouldn't just wait around for an opportunity. You go and take it. If I got a call up tomorrow and someone offered me $25,000 million, like $25, to go work at WWE events, I would go do it. If I got called up to go be, um, get and got a free airfare to go, see, um, go to E3, I would take that opportunity. If I was able to interview a wrestler for this podcast, I would take that opportunity in a heartbeat. Don't stick. You don't sit around for opportunities. You take them. If you have, if you see an opportunity standing, sitting right in front of you, you take it. You don't just sit there. I'll wait for it to come. Get this guy in the ring. Have the lights go out. Lights come back on. He hits a black mask on whoever's in the middle of the ring, and there you go. That's what I want to see. I'm tired of this guy just, just coming, just sitting there waiting for a fight. What the fuck? Next problem, we have Bailey come out before the commercial break. We come back from commercial break, and it's supposed to be Nikki Cross versus Bailey. Okay. Why is Nikki Cross coming out to Alexa Bliss's music? Did they shit can the Nikki Cross music? Because this made no sense. It's Nikki Cross versus Bailey, not Alexa Bliss with ba- with Nikki Cross. It's Nikki Cross with Alexa Bliss versus Bailey. Come on now, what the fuck is this? Not a bad match right here. Back from, and we come back from commercial break and Bliss taunts Bailey while she's hung upside down in the corner. Bailey tries to fight out and finally knocks Cross back. Bailey returns to the ring and starts mounting offense. Bailey with a close two count. More back and forth between the two. Bailey unloads and gets a non title win with a big flying elbow drop. She does actually, st- I thought she was going to miss this because she's standing on the top rope. Alexa Bliss is across the way, uh, bound over by the by where the stage the, the stage is at and she's just watching and she's actually looking and taking her she's taking a minute or two to look at Alexa Bliss. She stands up, points at Bliss, and then drops the elbow. I thought that she was going to 
get beat because she was going to do that, take the el- do the elbow, miss, and then get hit with a purge or something from Nikki Cross. That didn't happen. So Bailey rebounds after losing last week on, last night on Monday Night Raw by beating Nikki Cross. So to come the six man tag match cut main event, but before that we go backstage and we see Jinder Mahal and the referee trying to find the case that our truth was locked in. Truth is called that the cases are being loaded up for delivery to next Monday's Raw in Los Angeles, and we hear Truth screaming inside a case as it's loaded up. Carmelo appears. She's also looking for Truth. Carmelo is worried. Tom plays up the seriousness of the situation and says, Truth is being shipped to Raw. Yeah, so, okay, there you go. So, two days in a row, the WWE 24-7 champion is, has not ha- did not lose his championship. And it looks like he's not going to lose his championship till at least next Monday. Because he is stuck in a case. Oh god, I hope somebody finds out that he's in there because if he doesn't get out of that case, in the meantime, he's going to be six feet under. Back from break and we see the Firefly Funhouse that aired from last night. I'm just going to have to say this. I've seen a lot of people online. Because you know how people are. Like when John Moxley put that video out, people were just picking at every single pixel, every single scene. Trying to like depict that this guy's going to be at double or nothing, and John Moxley and the guy who did um, the the things came out and said, "No, that's not exactly what happened. It was a homage to Dusty." But people have taken the idea that the fact that Bray Wyatt, uh, when when he has the mallet in his hand and he has lines going down his eyes, the red lines going down his eyes. That that's a shot at Chris Jericho. He said Konnichiwa at the beginning of the thing. That's a shot at, w, at, New J- at Chris Jericho and Moxley. And the hammer looks like dice to people. And I'm thinking, you people are fucking stupid. First off, where are the dice? I see on the the bottom end of the mallet. When remember, like I think it was two weeks ago when he put that that looked like that paper plate with the drawing of the fiend in front of his face. That's what I saw on the end of the mallet that hit Rambling Rabbit. There were dots all around the side of the, uh, on the middle of the, of the, um, the mallet. How the hell does that look anything like dice? All oh, because dice have dots and you can't have dots on anything unless it's dice? Get fucking real. And the, the lines going down his eyes. Chris Jericho did not just invent lines on somebody's eyes. There was something that heavy metal, that, that fucking evil clowns do or shit like that. It's not... He had a nose, a clown nose. He was being an evil clown. You stupid, stupid fucking idiots. It had nothing to do with uh, taking shots at Chris Jericho or uh, John Moxley, New Japan, or AEW. The interviews that have been coming out from the directors of this shit have already said that all this shit was taped back in months ago. Before John Moxley left or before AEW was like for double or nothing. So anybody who thinks that any, like, this is just people reaching, like, oh, look, AEW takes shots at WWE, WWE's taking shots at AEW. Get real, motherfuckers. They have other ways they'll take shots at AEW, which we know they will. This is not one of them. This is from the mind of Bray Wyatt. Do you think Bray Wyatt really cares what's happening over there? No. He's worried about resurrecting his career. My question is, and I said this last night, he needs to get back into the ring and see what the fuck they do with him then. I don't see anything good happening with Bray Wyatt after these segments are done and he's in the ring. So, enjoy the Firefly Funhouse while you can. But stop trying to poke hole, like trying to poke and trying to fill holes that are not there. There's no, there's nothing at, w, at, 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 at like John Moxley, Chris Jericho, or AEW or New Japan. Just shut the fuck up about that and just move on. Kayla Braxton is backstage with Apollo. She brings up how Apollo was supposed to have a match against Andrade recently, but it didn't happen. We see what happened with Amos and the Intercontinental Champion Finn Balor um, that um, last week. Apollo says maybe Amos has tried to send a message to Balor, but he wa- when he's not here as an afterthought for in the next opportunity. Yeah, Apollo, you've been an afterthought for a very, very long time, so I don't know who you're trying to fool. And... And the next opportunity that he gets, he will... Selena Vega appears and ha- has words for Apollo. And she warns Apollo not to provoke Andrade because if she, he does, Almas will make sure he never has another match again. And she walks off. 
Jalen Braxton walks off, and we see Chad Gable with a notepad in his hand, just taking notes, taking notes on his pad. This is the first time we've seen Chad Gable on main roster television since the Superstar Shakeup, surprisingly. And his hair is shorter. He looks like he looks like that guy who he looks like a guy who is just watching. Who he looks like a driving instructor. You're sitting there, you know, you take, I haven't taken my driver's test yet, but I'm, I haven't done that ever. But you're like sitting there trying to take your driver's test and you mess up one time and the guy's just like, mm-hmm. Just writing down every mistake that you did. That's what it seems like he's doing right here. Again, he was on 205 Live tonight, so I don't know exactly what's going on with Chad Gable, but nice to see him. And he's not chasing after the 24-7 title, so that's a positive. Zane, Owens, and Dolph Ziggler versus The New Day. I have to really get into this match. This match was just standard paint by numbers. These guys did everything they could to give you an entertaining match. These six guys are four, six of the most talented guys on this fucking roster. I don't, I can't say nothing more about it. These guys should be out there. This should be, if you wanted to give us a SmackDown 6, this could be your SmackDown 6. Right here. Put these guys all on SmackDown, get rid of the wildcard rule, and let these six guys go at it. There's a SmackDown 6 for you. Dolph Ziggler, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, and all three members of The New Day, because when The New Day are serious, and The New Day are like the fun and games are over, we're coming out there to kick ass, they can fucking carry, they can, they can go better than anybody. Just saying. New Day ended up winning this one, no doubt about it, this was a long match, this went about, I believe, 25 minutes it felt like, it felt like 20 minutes at least, could be wrong. Biggie finally gets the hot tag as fans pop. Ziggler also comes in. Biggie unloads on Ziggler and tosses him overhead. Biggie dances. He did not have a knee pad on him, by the way, so it's nice to see him back at full strength. I still don't know what the point of him being back a couple weeks ago really did anything. I guess it was just a way to get Xavier Woods away from um, Kofi Kingston so Dolph Ziggler could attack, but you could have figured out something else. Hits the running splash on Ziggler in the middle of the ring. Fans rally for Biggie now. Biggie goes to spear Ziggler off the apron, but Ziggler gets the knee up. Biggie, I know you just came back from a serious knee injury, but could you please stop doing the spear through the ropes? Because I swear you're going to break your neck one of these times, and we really, really don't want to see you do that. Seriously. Just cut out the spear through the ropes because it's still scary as shit, and I swear it's one of those times that one bad spear through the ropes, and Biggie's career is done. More back and forth now, Kofi tags in as Biggie holds Ziggler in the air. The double team midnight hour attempt is broken up. Ziggler super kicks it Biggie. Kofi and Sammy are the legal men now. Sammy gets dropped by Ziggler by accident when Kofi moves. Ziggler ends up dropping Woods for a super kick next. Kofi levels Ziggler with a trouble in paradise. Kofi comes right back with another trouble in paradise on Sammy for the one, two, three. This was obviously the best part, best part of the show. It was a good match. These six guys, again, could be... If you wanted to give you a modern day SmackDown 6, these six guys could be that SmackDown 6 if you wanted it to be. I'm just saying. These guys should be out there killing it every single night. Kofi vs. Ziggler, I hope, will be a great ma a better match at Stomping Grounds. I think it should be. Because that was just a match that they wanted to get in and get out. Give them more time at Stomping Grounds. 20 minutes at least. Xavier Woods and Big E can now go for the bottom. We do have another tag team for the SmackDown tag team division now. It's the teams of Harper and Rowan, New Day, and, uh, and Heavy Machinery. So the tag team division on SmackDown getting a little bit better. But that was that. After the match, the New Day celebrated as music hits. Kofi raises the title. And we see Ziggler down on the floor covering outside the ring. And SmackDown goes off the air as the New Day celebrates. So, where are Kyrie Sane and Asuka? They've been gone for weeks. You had them get this awful shitty name, which I hopefully they'll get a different one. They haven't been seen. You had the uh, Idiotics last night on Monday Night Raw go out there and face two women that just were jobbers. And they won because they were jobbers. And that's the only match they have won since their only tag team title defense. And then those two have the audacity to come on to the, the WWE.com exclusives and be like, I like want competition. Want competition, but you guys have lost all but two matches since WrestleMania. So what the fuck are you talking about? I haven't seen Kyrie Stan or Asuka. 
um, no Finn Balor this week. He's like just off in I don't know where, and he's your Intercontinental Champion. Roman was not on Raw and SmackDown this week. I am fucking shocked. Probably had prior obligations. I think he had something to do with Hobbs and Shaw this week. Could be wrong. But yeah, he was off TV for both shows this week, which is absolutely surprising since Stomping Grounds is in a week from Sunday, and we have to get through next week's shows. Yay! I'm so excited for Stomping Grounds! Not really. Alexa Bliss, uh, Bailey versus Nikki Cross, okay match, the six-man tag match again, pretty damn, um, pretty good. But again, overall, this show was just flat. Why is SmackDown feeling so flat? The Wild Card Rule is not helping either one of these shows. Star Power, you need Star Power on both shows, and you had that show. I wish, like, the Star Power of Romy should have stayed on Raw, AJ stay on SmackDown, you have that big Star Power for both shows. All you had to do with the Superstar Shake-Up was just shuffle the undercard. That is it. Shuffle the undercard, shuffle the heels. If you wanted Drew McIntyre to come to SmackDown to get away from Roman, that would have been great. Elias could have been on SmackDown too, that would have been fine. Because you could have had AJ Styles versus, um, versus Drew McIntyre. AJ Styles is still selling an injury. He doesn't have anything special going on for his feud or anything, so that's why he's not going to be used right now, which is fine. Like, Finn Balor, I don't know why he wasn't on SmackDown this week. I don't know what's going on with that. The only appearance he's had since Money in the Bank was Stomp was, um, was Super Showdown. I don't even know if he's going to be at Stomping Grounds. We'll have to wait and see, but this show just was so flat. Again, if I had a choice between Raw, SmackDown, or going to E3 for the entire time, my ass is going to E3 and SmackDown Raw can kiss my ass. That is all for this show. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on tw Twitch and Twitter, Twitch and Twitter at the Frost Club, and I will see you guys tomorrow for I think will be probably one of the best, like for is going to be a really good NXT. No storyline advancements are probably going to happen for the simple fact is this was taped before Takeover 25 at a house show, like on a house show run that they did. But Kushida versus Drew Gulak. It's a mission match. Danny Burch, only look in undisputed era, and we know what those two did at TakeOver Chicago last year. I cannot wait to see those matches, and we'll talk about it tomorrow night. Until then, my name is France, and I am getting out of here. Have a good one.